but my first guest to my left is around my age, but it's just unbelievable how much she's achieved at her young age. She's a first year student at the University of Cambridge, studying HSPS, but as if that's not enough, she's also got an honorary doctorate already from the University of Bristol. Now you might be wondering, how is that possible? What has she done? Well, she is an international activist She's spoken alongside the likes of Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, Emma Watson at COP26, and that's just the start of her accolades. She has written a personal memoir at the age of 20, and the purpose of this is to draw attention to wildlife and to promote uh, diversity. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce Maya Rose Craig, and welcome to The Sunday Show. Hi, thank you for having me. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? I am so excited to be able to interview you, honestly. <laughs> because I'm fascinated by your story. I think it's worth mentioning that she's visited every continent on Earth and uh, to have done that by her age, I mean, not even her age, a few years ago, takes an enormous amount of dedication. So I'm very curious to find out what motivated you to visit every continent on Earth? I mean, I've always been very, very passionate about nature and the outdoors and, and birds especially, hence Bird Girl. And, um, and so I spent a lot of my childhood, I was very lucky, my parents took me travelling a lot and took me all over the world in order to see birds, basically. And so we'd sort of ended up going to six different continents in this pursuit of birds. And it was only when we realised we only had one left, Antarctica, that we realised we really wanted to see some penguins. And I feel incredibly lucky to have been able to do that as well. And you mentioned Bird Girl, so we've actually got uh, a picture here. And <laughs> Bird Girl is a book that I think everyone should read. Uh, but I think let's hear from you about what this book uh, means and uh, what it is that you want to convey through this book, Bird Girl. I suppose it's a few things and like I want to acknowledge that it's probably quite strange that I've written a, a memoir when I was 19 years old and the purpose wasn't that I felt like I had some amazing life where I had to tell the story before I'd even turned 20. It was that I really love nature and the outdoors and I wanted someone to be able to read it and also fall in love with nature and the outdoors. But it's also so much more than that. It talks about all of my activism and campaigning, all of the stuff I've done in terms of climate change and things like that, um, but also um, a project more personal to me, Black to Nature, which works with um, black and Asian children um, in my area to take them outdoors. Um, and it's also got lots of very personal things going on. It talks a lot about uh, me as a Bangladeshi person spending time in a very white space that is the English countryside and how I decided to bring more people into that. It even talks about um, a very, very special special trip I made to Bangladesh a few years ago in order to save an amazing bird there called the spoon dodd Sandpiper and the whole sort of uh, journey that encomp encompassed that, I suppose. What really fascinated me is when you said there's only around 200 of them left in the world. That must have been an amazing moment to witness something so rare. What was that moment like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the reasons, the, sp the spoonboard sandpiper is a very rare bird that lives in the mudflats in the south of Bangladesh near Cox's Bazaar. And, um, you know, it's very, very rare, but there are lots of birds that are very rare. And I think part of the reason that it appealed to me was because it was a bird in Bangladesh. And um, I went in 2015 when I was 13 because I felt like if I told people in Bangladesh about this, they would Get also be excited and also want to help and also be interested in the plight of this bird. And they were. That was the really exciting thing. And, I mean, um, who wouldn't want to get on board if they see someone yeah. so young, so passionate, doing so much? And I mean, your journey started when you were quite young, because I've heard that when you were seven, you were on a BBC documentary. <laughs> so clearly you've been at this for quite some time. And uh, if we bring back the theme of um, mental health, which is obviously discussed in this book as well, what is the significance of being in nature and how does mental health tie in with this, especially because we've got many British Bangladeshi viewers watching? Uh, how would you say that those themes tied in uh, within your book? I think like the message over and over again in Bird Girl is just that being outside is really good for you and it's really good for your brain and in fact um, it's very detrimental to not be spending time outdoors and I think especially in the UK it's such a privilege to have access to nature in the countryside I think it is seen as a very white thing basically and I think that is having a really negative impact on people's brains and so like something I talk about in the book over and over again is how important it's been for me and my family to spend time outdoors really actively um, especially when it comes to dealing with um, you know mental health and well-being and all that sort of thing. 
clearly this book is going to have an impact on a very large audience and I've heard that you're going on tour as well. Uh, so how does it feel to be able to go on tour with a book that you've written at such a young age? Oh, it's been crazy. Um, I finished my first year of university three weeks ago. And the book came out, thank you, the book came out two weeks ago and it's just been crazy. And but milestone it's been so after exciting. milestone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been sort of going really, really fast, but I, I am really excited that it's finally come out after all this time and that I can talk about it with you and yeah. And of course, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Um, with regards to the charity that you mentioned, the, the Black to Nature, because obviously you're very young and you're, you're doing all this activism, uh, what's the work of the charity uh, doing? at the moment? Um, so the charity is basically fighting um, the fact that there's a lot of racism and discrimination and prejudice within environmental spaces and um, that can be shown in lots of different ways. The fact that people do really struggle to sort of get to really nice urban green spaces or to get out into the countryside, despite the fact that it is really good for us. So we run nature camps, um, working with kids from Bristol and London and things like that, taking them out, helping them um, get into nature and things like that. Um, but we're also doing much bigger campaigning um, within various sectors in the UK, within the climate change movement, and basically trying to ev make everything more equal and more equitable. And I think that is you know, I think that social issues are very, very important, even when it comes to talking about environmental things, which is why Black to Nature has been a very special project for me since I was 13 years old. And it obviously ties in with your degree subject as well, so you're very uh, <laughs> concerned about social issues, and you're also going as far as to educate yourself further on this at a university like Cambridge, which is amazing. So, of course, it's one thing to observe birds, and it's another thing to be an activist and to take this so seriously and to make this your life's mission. How did it morph into being just a girl watching birds <laughs> to being this international superstar? Um, it's been a really strange journey um, and it all started because I started talk talking about um, birds online when I was 11 um, purely because I just really loved them and I wanted to share that with other people and that sort of exploded into this massive online platform and I think um, as you know, I had loads and loads of people watching me. Um, I sort of felt more and more like I needed to talk about things. And the very first issue I actually campaigned on was there was a massive oil spill in Bangladesh in um, 2013 or 2014, I think, in the Shindabond. And no one in the West was talking about it. No one I knew in the UK or America was talking about it. And so I started this massive campaign that ended up raising loads of money when I was 11. And I think that just told me that if I really cared about something, I could make a difference and I could make it better. And I, I think that's a really important lesson for everyone out there, really. It's a prime example that if you want to make a change in the world, it's possible mm. if you stick at it. And if you have a passion, then you can really turn it into your life's mission. Now, I saw a quote uh, about you in The Guardian, which was saying that you believe that this movement, it's not really an individual thing, but more of a collective kind of um, effort. So could you expand on what you mean by this? quote for our viewers? Um, I think especially with the internet it's really easy to focus on individual people and what they're doing and you can see that with loads of fantastic people like the ones you mentioned Greta and Malala and people like that but I think to create change you need everyone on board and you need everyone to want to make change um, and so I suppose what I mean is no single person can change the world but if we all work together we can make it a better place and we can make a difference um, even in the face of things that seem like really really big problems like um, climate change for example. Which you spoke about of course at COP26, a platform, what a platform to, <laughs> to speak at and uh, if young people are watching this which I'm sure they are, how can they get behind you and also join your campaign um, in order to, to follow your footsteps potentially? <laughs> Um, I think there's so many things that can be done, even from home. I think talking about issues online and, um, you know, joining campaigns, even writing, um, you know, in the UK to your local MP makes a big difference. Um, but I think also raising awareness about climate change. I think for so many people, they don't really realise what it is, what it looks like. And so especially when I'm talking um, to people with family from Bangladesh, just talking about all the cyclones and the flooding and things like that, I think 
lots and lots of people have family who are really, really struggling there at the moment. And so I think helping people to realize that that is climate change and that is something that we can stop and change, um, I think would make a really, really big difference. I think in light of recent events with increased flooding and of course mm. heat waves, more and more people are thinking like this is an actual emergency. Yeah. But it's sad that it needs to get to a stage like that for people to realize that it's an emergency because of course it's an ongoing emergency. So how do you think we can further raise awareness? I mean, from an activist like yourself, I'd like to hear uh, how we can actually influence people in order to consider this an emergency. and of course, with the mission of protecting diversity of wildlife, because that's something that you do. It is, yeah. Um, and I think it's lots of different things. Um, like I mentioned, I think raising awareness and educating people, um, I personally do think that protesting is incredibly important in terms of um, having your voice within a democracy. I also think in terms of the work that Black to Nature does, for example, actually um, for an issue like biodiversity loss, showing people nature, showing them what um, you know, the outdoors and wildlife can look like um, helps people to understand what we're losing. Because I think for a lot of people talking about species going extinct and things like that, that doesn't mean anything um, because they've never sort of experienced that. But you, of course, experienced that firsthand. And I read that you were sleeping on mountains, <laughs> in, the, in the desert, in all these kind of uh, very extreme conditions. Uh, so what was that experience like, you know, traveling the world and not even knowing where you're going to wake up and what the temperature is going to be like? I mean, that must have been crazy. It was. And I think there are lots of things I look back and it was like that was a little bit crazy. But I think... Um, my family and I have always been very obsessed with birds and that is kind of where the obsession took us. Um, but I think even though it was, a, it was kind of insane, like I think I look back and I think that was such an amazing experience for me as a child to have had and I feel incredibly lucky and I do also think that's probably why I was so young when I um, became very passionate about lots of issues going on in the world because, you know, I saw plastic pollution, I saw forest fires or deforestation or flooding or climate change and I think... Um, seeing those with first hand with your own eyes helps you realise just how major everything going on in the world is, which is why I say it's my love of birds and nature and bird watching that helped me to become an activist and campaigner. So the fact that birds are so beautiful and you fell in love with them is actually <laughs> helping to save the world further. Yeah, even even so. animals that aren't birds are benefiting from your activism because of all the work that you're doing in this sphere. So, of course, we've got this lovely book sitting on the table. Would you like to hold it up to the yeah, camera? Of course. Everyone can have a look at the amazing cover that we've got here. <laughs> so uh, in relation to the book, of course, and the fact that you've done so much at a young age, what would you say are your plans for the near future with taking this activism forwards? I think there's a few different things. Like, obviously, I'm halfway through uni, and I think I'm definitely taking my education very seriously. I'm really enjoying my degree. Um, but I think otherwise... Um, you know, there's so many different things. Obviously, my hope is that I don't have to campaign for things like biodiversity loss or climate change forever. Hopefully, those issues will eventually be solved. And so I think um, hopefully just getting a good job that's related to birds or nature in some way would be amazing, because I think that's the one thing I'm certain of, that I will always be bird watching and spending time outdoors. I mean, activism is a very important job in itself. <laughs> and if anyone else wants to be an activist, uh, what kind of tips would you have for them? Um, I think... I think activist is a very scary word. It's sort of very intimidating. And the word activist means just someone who does something. Um, and that can be anything, someone who is active. So I think just going outside, trying to make a change in any way, in terms of environmental issues, that can be as simple as talking to your neighbours about the issues that are going on. It can be going to a protest, writing stuff online, doing stuff in school. Every little thing does make a difference and it does help. It's this collective thing that I was talking about earlier. That ties in quite nicely with everything that you've said. But of course, things can happen on a small scale or on an international mm. scale. And you mentioned that you went to Bangladesh and you saw this really beautiful bird. So if you could tell us more about your experience in Bangladesh, because of course, being a, a British Bangladeshi, I'm sure our Bangladeshi viewers are itching to hear about your experience of Bangladesh itself. Yeah, it was sort of, it's this thing where this bird, like you said, was very, very endangered. There were only 200 left in the world. And, um, you know, it had issues all up and down the Asian coastline, but it was struggling in Bangladesh in particular. And um, I sort of, I didn't feel like I could do anything. I was 13 at the time. And then I realised that actually the one thing I did have was a voice. And so I ended up going out to Bangladesh, um, partially because I just really wanted to see the bird and help survey it. But I ended up doing lots of stuff in the newspapers and things like that, telling people, because most people didn't know that this is a very, very important bird. Bangladesh is incredibly important in terms of keeping this bird alive. And the really lovely thing was that people did 
connect and engage with that. And I think the strangest ex experience was when my mum um, and I went to a parlour and there was a girl there who was, um, you know, um, doing the nails and things like that. And she suddenly looked at me and she went, um, you love birds, don't you? And she said that she'd seen You're the it bird on girl. the TV. Yeah, she said she'd seen it on the TV and it was because of that, that she knew that there was something really rare and she knew that there was something that she needed to care about. And I think that was just such a special experience. And like I said, I'm doing, I'm doing campaigns all over the world and it was so lovely to be able to do something in Bangladesh. So how can people get their hands on this wonderful book? Um, it's pretty much everywhere. It's on all of the normal online sites and stuff like that. But it's also um, in the UK. It's in most Waterstones and bookshops. So I think, you know, Amazon, All the major platforms all that, all are featuring sort of it. Of course, yeah. uh, everyone will love to read this, I'm sure. It's been an absolute pleasure hearing from you and uh, learning more about your story. And I'm sure our viewers here who are listening today will love to read your book. So thank you so much for being with us um, on the Chandler Sunday Show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure.